I'd like to welcome everybody to the first session of this morning. Um, one bit of housekeeping, we did find a, somebody lost their card. Anybody does, we'll keep it up here. You can come by later and get it. Okay, we're gonna do three sessions in a row and then we'll have a short break. Uh, the first session is gonna be by John Morris. It's called Disk Imaging with Applesauce. John's gonna discuss the development of the floppy drive controller that enables you to connect your Apple II floppy drive directly to your modern computer. Thanks, John. Okay. Um, let me get up my, my, the slide that I made. Because, yeah. Wait, yeah. hey, okay. Yep. That's my slide. Okay, so we're talking about disk imaging. Um, basically, I had a problem with my EDD card. It crapped out on me. And I wanted to do something different. Um, and so basically, just as on a while here, I embarked on this journey to try to capture disk information in a different way. Um, that's the end of my slideshow. <laughs> yep, that's the whole thing. I, I came planning to do my slides while I was here. Um, I've just been having too much damn fun, so yeah, that's the whole slideshow. <laughs> and you need to save it. <laughs> I don't need to save it. <laughs> no, yeah, maybe, we'll see. Okay, so what I ended up building is a hardware device that I call the Applesauce. And it basically is a floppy drive controller that allows you to directly connect a disk to via USB to a modern computer. Um, well, so I have to say, that's, 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 that's really it. Okay, so we're gonna dive into the nuts and bolts because it's nice and early. I'm sure everyone's fresh. Um, so we are going to start at what is actually on a disk. You know, there's a common idea that a floppy disk contains zeros and ones. That actually is not correct at all. A floppy disk contains ones, and only ones. So what is going on is we basically have, you know, a strip of magnetism. Everything either faces north or south. Um, as the head rolls over this information, or the information rolls past the head, whichever way you want to look at it, the head picks it up, and if the bits there are north facing, it sends the AC current one way, if it's south facing, it sends the current the other way. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. What the drive does is there's one chip that's at the heart of it, this is a, called the 3470, and it basically looks for the current to change one way or the other. So whenever it sees it change from north to south or south to north, it sends a message out. That message is a one. It's a one microsecond <coughs> long pulse, which denotes a one. Zeros <coughs> are derived by the lack of any pulses over time. You know, the Apple II basically expects a pulse every four microseconds. And if there isn't one happening there, when it does find one, it basically says, hey, it's been about eight microseconds, so let's say that's a zero and a one then. So the gap makes the zeros. Um, this thing's gonna keep going to sleep on me. So taking this, basically what that, you know, you hear in terms of flux, you know, the flux transitions, that is the movement of north to south or south to north, okay? So what the applesauce does is it connects up and it reads the flux transitions direct, directly. It grabs every transition on the disk and it measures the amount of time in nanoseconds between these transitions. And what it does is it can take that stream and create bit streams and turn them into nibble streams and take it all the way from being a bunch of pulses to actually being the data, basically what the floppy drive controller does. 
Um, we will do a quick, I just pulled discs out from upstairs, so your mileage may vary in terms of what we actually get here, but we'll do a quick demo of the fast disc imager here. So, you wrote this? yes. So this is it, pulling the tracks. It's determined that it's 16 sectors. Do what you do what you do. Okay, hey, it successfully got everything. That's nice. So this is, what did this, what did this just say? So this is early games. Okay, so we're just gonna write on early games. We'll save that. Is this a USB interface to the Mac? Yes. And so this is it, basically it's just an old disc two yeah. with a power supply and a little bit of, you know, voodoo on it. So in our disc, okay, here we have early games DSK. So we'll just double click it, open up the emulator. And hopefully it does something. Oh, early oh. games, for real. All right. Woo! So, So this, these are, you know, this is, it's enough. It's very early, you know. It doesn't even need you to necessarily. Oh, oh, we do have addition. Okay. So this basically is going through a bunch of steps. It's pulling the fluxes, turning them into bits, turning those into nibbles, turning the nibbles, you know, de-encoding it, and this is creating a disk image. This is what it does for. Um, what you can use for unprotected disks because it uses a lot of techniques to try to do data repair. This one came in fine, um, but it'll do a lot of, you know, if the address parts of the disk are bad, it will hunt for hunks of data, it'll bring things back, it'll, if you have bad nibbles, it'll figure out what nibbles are wrong and it'll go and it'll look at the flux transitions that actually made up the nibbles and determine what other potential values that nibble could have been, verify that against the checksum, and basically it'll try to recreate the data within the chunk if it's lost. So it, can, it uses a lot of different techniques, but all of these rely on the fact that the disk has a known structure, whether it's ProDOS, DOS 3.3, DOS 3.2, um, you know, there's, there, there were parts implemented in it to enable it to work. You know, when DOS works, it has, you know, address prologs and data and, you know, everything has its little checksums on it because really the drives, eh, they're not particularly accurate. So it really is kind of a... So you're telling me that when it reads the disk, it's actually verifying the data is 100% correct before making the image? Yes. Wow. Does EDD do that? No, EDD doesn't do any validation of data. Interesting, thank you. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that, this is Henry Michel. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stranger. <laughs> so, um, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of ways to do data recovery just from knowing the fact that there is a set structure. And so it can be very aggressive in doing that. Um, you know, when it comes to copy protection, you know, it kind of turned into a wild west out there with the, the whole escalation. You know, all of the, when it comes to real DOS, like DOS 3.3, all of the address chunks on the disk, you know, they start with D5A96. I'm sure all of you guys have heard of that little sequence. That's kind of the beginning of the address information for a sector. <laughs> because in the end, there is no physical sectors. Everything's just kind of logically laid out in one big loop. So you put little keys in here, and as it runs through these, it finds this and goes, okay, this is the sector. Let's look at the sector number. Hey, this matches what we're looking for. Okay, let's grab the data that's following it. And it grabs that, and that's your sector. Of course, publishers didn't like that because, well, now you can copy everything. So they started simply in saying, okay, well, instead of D5A96, well, let's make it 97. 
So when you try to copy with copy A, it, it sits there and goes, I don't see any sectors. There's, there's nothing on this disk. Even though it's right there, it just does not know how to recognize it anymore. That's kind of where early protection started, and from there, the cat and mouse game skyrocketed. And when it skyrocketed, you know, you then had bit copiers. It's like, you know what, bit copiers, they don't care if it says D5A96. It doesn't matter, it just, it just wants the bits. It doesn't, it doesn't care about whether it's a sector or not. It just grabs the raw information. So then what the copy protection folks came up with as one of the techniques, they had many, many different techniques, but one of them was actually an exploitation of the 3470 chip within the drive. This chip that creates the pulses that make the bits. And what they noticed was, which really was fairly commonly known, you know, the, the whole idea that you can't have more than two zeros in a row on a disk really is because you can't have too much time of the 3470 not seeing anything. When it doesn't see anything, it thinks it's not doing its job well. It has a little amplifier, and it keeps turning up this little amplifier to try to find the, the data that it's supposed to be finding until it gets to the point that it's just amplifying its own noise within the circuit on the analog board, and it goes, Pluh! here's a bit for you. Pluh! Here's a bit for you. And it throws up. It throws up randomly. So you put a large empty space and it gets filled with garbage, which is why you can't have more than two zeros in a row. Because, well, after that, it just turns into yeah. randomness. So to defeat bit copiers, a lot of publishers went and put a big empty area, no transitions. In this part of the disk, I don't want there to be any transitions here. When they run it, they read that area. They look at it and say, okay, I, I see these bits here. Let's spin the disk around again. Look at it now. What does it say now? Oh, this is all different. Okay, look at it again. Yep, it's all different. Okay. We know that this is a real disk because these bits keep changing. When you put it into Copy2 Plus or EDD or whatever, it runs through and it hits this transition, you know, there's no transition area, and these random bits spit out. And Copy2 Plus thinks that those bits are real. It doesn't understand whether something is real or fake. It grabs these bits and it cements those in as being part of the image. Say, hey, I got your bits, <coughs> and I put them in here. When the software runs, it comes to this area and looks at it and says, okay, I have this pattern of bits here. Spin around. Hey, it's the same. Hmm. Spin it around. Okay, wait, this isn't changing at all. And it knows that it is a copy. So that that's really tricky. It's, yep. Um, I was wondering from the perspective of like assembly language level, we're dealing all the time with strings of zeros, strings of ones, you know, there's all sorts of different patterns. How is the floppy controller actually converting from the electromagnetism world where you can't have two zeros in a row into the usable data world where obviously that happens all the time? Yeah. That is called the nibble. So for DOS 3, 3 and above, there are basically a finite set of numbers. It's, it's what's called six and two encoding is what it uses. And it actually is a set of nibbles that never have more than two zeros in a row. And it puts it through this funky little, you know, logic sequence to actually take your 256 bytes for your sector and it'll spit out 342 nibbles that will represent the 256 bytes. So it increases in size, but you can encode all the data without ever having more than two zeros. So that's 300 some odd. 342. Being stored in, in typically the Apple CPU's memory as part of. The yes. So yes. So when, when you when you yes when you tell DOS to write a sector, it's going to take you know, say so you say this is the 256 bytes for my sector. 
and then it's going to take that and it's going to nibbleize this out. It's going to make 342 bytes with a checksum on the end so that it can make sure that the, you know, it's a simple XOR, but it'll basically make sure that, you know, all data when it gets read back in later on matches up. So, you know, that was part of the thing with, you know, DOS 3.2, 13 sector disks. They used five and three encoding. It required 410 nibbles to do it because the rules for five and three encoding and the earlier chip, you know, the earlier state machine chip itself was that there could only be one zero. And so the idea of putting, you know, when they came up with the DOS 3.3, they came up with the new six and two encoding. They were able to shrink the size of the packets from 410 to 342, and that's how they gained the room for the additional three sectors. But yeah, so there was, there was an intermediate stage in there solely for being able to take binary, because, well, how do, you, how do you store zero? You know, the zero actually gets stored as, you know, well, it's 96 plus a couple of other things. But, you know, um, you know, yeah, they all get converted to nibbles. And it's that, it's that intermediate nibble stage. Yep. So, let's see, where was I? Um, Henry, where was I? Standing there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so, so basically they came up with a way to make bit copiers suffer a lot in terms of they can't capture these bits. And, and you, it's really, really hard to go into and say, you know, when you have a bit stream, to say what is real and what is fake. You know, you have the problem that you kind of need to make an assumption that every bit is happening at four microseconds, which is a little bit unfair because bit, you know, the transitions happen really it's pretty variable the the drive speed is constantly wiggling around it, it's it, it's amazing that the whole thing works at all really <laughs> you know there's there are so many variables to what is going on um, it's um, yeah it's it's it was did an amazing job doing it with what he did it with um, let's see well I just drew a complete blank now so we will go into, okay, so what Applesauce does, and I'll pull a, another disk here, Master Type, the typing instruction game. Sounds fascinating. Okay. So, like I said, fast disk imager, works great with unprotected stuff. So what do we do with protected things? Protected things has a flux imager. Okay, this flux imager, this is pulling everything, it basically, it is recording every flux transition on the disk and the number of, really it's the number of microseconds between each flux transition. Um, another part of Applesauce is that it actually can locate where every flux transition exists on the media itself. Um, it has a special sensor that you mount inside that watches the spindle that gives me signals so that I can actually keep the alignment of all the tracks because that was, you know, when, yeah. mm -hmm. uh -huh. coming up with something. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what it looks like. But, um, you know, this basically is disk <coughs> flux. The, the, the density of the fluxes, basically higher bit values show up in brighter colors um, or brighter grays. What, what do you do for empty parts of the disk that have no transition? How does uh, how yeah, so detect and remove all the noise? Yeah, okay, so what, what this does, when it, when it comes to these areas of no transitions, you know, obviously the real bits, we can get fine but we still need to do this, deal with this problem of the fake bits. Luckily, real bits don't move around. We have a little bit of variance due to the drive speed, but they maintain a consistent timing to all their neighbors. So while having the timing, we can basically say, you know, okay, this is 
you know, these all match up. When we go across multiple reads of the same track, which Applesauce is grabbing five copies of every quarter track as it's pulling this stuff in, it can actually look at it and say, is this consistent? Is the timing between these bits consistent? And then when it gets to this area of no transition where we have random bits getting thrown in, we can kind of look at one side and say, you know, we have solid bits here. These, these ones are good. And we see solid bits here. In the middle, these bits are all shifted in time. They don't match up. They dance around. The number of them change. So, you know, it kind of turns into just a big garble. So when you look at it across multiple reads, you have things moving around. They're not consistent. And Applesauce will basically see that these bits are being inconsistent and find the extents of it of where things, you know, look like they're physically written to the disk and where they're being generated by 3470 and it will eliminate the fake bits. So it will pull the false things out. Um, well, this is an interesting one. What's the so, pattern name? What's the pattern name? <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on here? Track zero is basically at this outside edge, which I got something funky going in here with a bunch of nothingness. These dividers here, these are all between the sectors. You know, between all the sectors, when you have a bunch of bits in a stream, it's like, where do they start? You know, you, you want to break them down into nibbles, but, well, I just got a bunch of bits. How do I know where, the, where things are starting? And that is done typically with sync nibbles. The, the typical one is a FF followed by two zeros which kind of delay the system. And when you have at least four of these in a row, you know, the, the logic machine within the Apple II sees this and it will bring it into sync because of the way things interleave. And so if you have four, su four sets of, no, not me. If you, if you have four sets of these sync nibbles, it will bring it into, bring it into alignment and guarantee that you have alignment through the data that you have. Um, so these vertical lines here are the sync areas. So this is where it is telling the system that it wants to make sure that the data that's following it is properly synchronized. So it ends up leaving basically watermarks on here. What's interesting about this is this is not done on a regular disk too. Because on a regular disk two, all these things actually are skewed. Because a disk two, it has no timing. It has no idea of the position of the disk when it writes a sector. When it starts writing a sector, it writes it wherever it happens to be. It just sits there and says, okay, next sector. It doesn't care, it's writing an entire track. Um, this, having every single sector aligned this way, it's obviously coming off of high-end equipment um, that is writing, you know, at least has hardware synchronization on the disk or is writing the entire set of tracks simultaneously. Um, you know, this darker area here, that's more than likely the fudge factor when you're writing it. You have a lot of variance in drive speeds and so what they tend to do is they'll write a big area of sync stuff and then they'll write the track and they'll come around and then they'll overwrite the end of that. So they make sure that they have a good set of bits all around and you know it's, it's the safest way to do that. So that's what this fat chunk here more than likely is. The dark areas here, I'm not sure what they're doing there. They're, they're, they're playing some games here. <laughs> you know, let's, um, they're throwing a lot of nothingness on track zero, which is a little bit important for starting things up. So, um, so yeah, basically, well, that's that's a distance image there. We have master type now. Okay. If you save that, what do you get? So this is generating um, a raw file. So, you know, part of part of this is, you know the idea that we want to be able to improve the ability to you know recognize and analyze disks 
Um, but we do have all the discs failing. You know, that's like the, the, the work that Mark is doing is trying to save these things before they're all gone. This is kind of another way to do that because what I'm doing is I pull five copies of every flux transition off of the disc and then it gives us something that we can process later. When you've captured this, you've captured everything including the uh, enough statistical information to be able to keep the copy protection intact. And that is a big part of what I want to do. I want to have, I want to be able to preserve, they, they did some crazy amazing things in the protection stuff. I mean, sometimes I'm working on this and I start looking at the, the disc and like, wow, what are they doing here? And then I spend two hours spelunking through disc images, like just exploring the craziness that they came up with to keep people from being able to copy their disc. And it's, it's truly fascinating. It's, it, it really is an art form in itself. You know, and a lot of times it's far more interesting than the content actually <laughs> on, the, on the disc, you know. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's just a lot of brilliance there. Um, so what this is doing is it will generate um, an AS, or an, an A2R file, a master type. What is that process A2R button? Well, I'll show you that. Okay. Got two minutes. I got about two minutes? Okay, I'm, I'll, okay I'll, I'll show you that really fast. Okay, so um, <laughs> what this ends up generating in A2R runs between 26 <laughs> and 32 megabytes for a single disk. Um, you know, they are huge. But they are not what I'm aiming to have out there for public consumption. This is what you will use to generate disk images in other formats. Um, unfortunately, nibs, they're terrible in terms of, you know, they'll, they'll, they can contain the most simplest forms of copy protection. Um, you know, but when it, when it simply comes down to it, there isn't a disk image format that can actually contain a disk with the copy protection intact. And the process A2R will actually let you go to an archive and it will extract everything and be able to generate different disk images, be able to have different analysis stuff. So if you had a giant repository of A2Rs and you realized, hey, let's come up with a new file format or whatever, you could actually just dump all of these in and be able to generate images solely based off of this because you, there is no interpretation of the information here. The raw is the raw timing of flux transitions. There's no, oh, is there a bit here or not? Is this a one or a zero? There's, there's no questions involved in it. This is the raw disk, uh, you know, in its lowest form. Um, there's some other images that I've done, I like Choplifter. This is spiral tracking. You know, everyone talks about, oh, this is the spiral track. I don't have noise reduction going on it. This is normally black. This is to track all oh, some funky spiral. They, he did not believe in actually having sectors. Um, oh, this is what I have to do. Oh, that's what, this one, there's, you have a little bit of sync field. You got, definitely have something different going on in the center of the disk cool little spiral pattern. And so part of when, when AppleSolves actually generates the RAWs, it's actually generating 1K by 1K PNG images of what the physical layout of the disk looks like as well, so that that can be saved along with the archives. Well, here, Frogger, this is, this is Spira disk. Um, this is basically all empty. The entire game actually exists on this edge. <coughs> really tightly packed in quarter tracks that are interleaving each other so that they don't interfere and um, it's insanity here. This yeah, is this fire yeah. is, is this crazy? Is fire disc? Yeah, it's saying. So Peter says it's crazy, it's crazy. Um, a, a, no, it's, the, the hardware itself is, is pretty straightforward. Really, it is an interface. It's, most of this is done by software. Um, you know, I'm pulling the fluxes, running, you know, it'll keep them accurate to within about 125 nanoseconds. Um, and that's its clock. And any questions for 30 seconds? When can we buy this? Um, working on that. Uh, 
The hardware, well, I was hoping it was about done. I'm seeing a couple of problems with things exploding. So, <laughs> so fire bad. Well, no, no, there's no fire, but um, I want to definitely make some revisions. I'll probably be looking at ordering new boards probably within about a month or so. Um, there's still stuff I want to do on the software side of things. Um, working with a bunch of people here to try to come up, you know, trying to standardize the image, you know, the image formats, things like that. Just do 34 tracks. I guess the, the earliest drives can only do 34, but the later ones can do more. Like Reyna had some drives that did more. Um, yeah. Right now, I only have it scan the 35 tracks. So you know, I do go for the hex 23. Um, it's doing it images everything on the quarter tracks. Um, there's no reason why it couldn't go to 40, except that the drives that I have it hooked up to, um, which it just hooks up standard. I mean, I can take this and plug it into my Apple II and it'll work just fine. So, you know, you don't have to make any, you install a sensor, but it makes no permanent electrical changes to the drive. Um, can this be used to read portions of unprotected damaged disks or not really? Yes, it can. Because that's like what it does you know, the same way I do with the disk imager, it, it can go through and when it finds damaged areas, it can point out, you know, there's something nutty here and allow you to look at that and it will show you the flux transitions that do exist for it. And so actually I actually have a whole other tool that I'm working on after this that really is just getting into a disk and being able to dive in, being able to look at, you know, almost like a nibble editor, you know, you kind of go sector down to nibble down to bits and then be able to look at individual fluxes that are associated with every nibble on the disk. And then would it be able to isolate <coughs> what should be there yes. based on the, without you having to do it yourself? Um, the, the, disk, the DSK imager does that, yes. It does do that. Yes. <laughs> so because it has the checksum there, it looks at what bits it has and it looks at variations of yeah. what it could possibly be and then cross-checks that with the checksums. One more question. Uh, would you be able to extend the software to make the disk queue image other formats of disks? Like yes, absolutely. And the entire interface to the applesauce um, open sourcing, it's a nice simple interface. So if anyone else wants to write software that accesses the drive, more than welcome to. Um, you know, encourage it. Can it be used with a five and a quarter Unidisc, or does it have to be a disc? Um, it will work fine with a with a Unidisc, but a Unidisc is so tightly packed you cannot get a sync sensor in there. So if you're doing unprotected things or, or even protected things that don't require cross track synchronization, you can do it. Um, but if the protection requires that all the tracks be synced, you know, because it jumps back and forth because a disc two can't replicate that, um, then, yeah, you need the sync sensor, and there just is not room inside the, the unit disk case. Can I take one more? <laughs> <laughs>